Okay, good morning. So um, thanks, Rob, and welcome everyone to, to day two of the, the BIFOR meeting. Um, my talk today really is going to cover sort of the, the insect biology um, projects that we've been running within the, the BIFOR phase facility. Um, and I, I'm sort of the, 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 the lead of the core insect projects. There are a number of um, applications and grant applications now that have been successful that have an insect element, but this is sort of the core stuff that we've been doing within the phase facility, specifically looking at these insect plant interactions um, and beyond, and by beyond, I'll explain that as I go through, but kind of beyond within the system itself. So not just talking about the insects and plants and how they interact, but how that then connects in with all the other data that's being collected actually within the face site. Um, but also um, beyond the woodland system itself, because it's important to remember we're looking at part of a landscape and, and woodlands are a much bigger part of that. And the under climate change predominantly is me talking about elevated CO2, but I'll throw in a, a couple of other things as well. So the turnout apparently yesterday was fantastic. So maybe all of you um, attending today have already had the, the background to the by four face, but I thought it best not to assume that entirely. So I'll just give you a very brief overview of the facility because I'm the, the first talk of this today. So this is nestled in a, an area of woodland. Um, and as you can see from those photos, actually it's, it's pretty discreet despite the size of these um, structures. Uh, and it was amazing how these, when these things were, were put in place that there was very minimal impact, sort of almost no footprint whatsoever and certainly nothing permanently damaging the, the forest floor. Um, and no real um, change to the, the canopy structure. And it was a, a massive effort getting these things set up. So we now have this wonderful phase facility where we have nine different um, arrays where we conduct experiments and these are split into three groups. So we've got the, the three treatment arrays um, where we're pumping in 150 parts per million of, of CO2 above ambient. So we've got systems sensing what ambient um, CO2 is and it can keep monitoring and altering the levels going into to those arrays. We also have um, three arrays which are then our, one of our controls and these are just pumping in ambient air. Um, and then we have the three no infrastructure controls, which we call the ghost arrays. Um, and for, for many projects, these are really important. Most of the stuff I'm going to talk about actually won't be um, referring to data from, from the ghost arrays, but it's important that we have that background and look at, to check that the infrastructure isn't having a, an effect. Um, the first growing season was 2017. We baselined the site 2015, 2016, but most of the data I'm going to talk about today is actually from the 2017, 20, 2018 years. So when we thought about all of the kind of questions we might address within by four face, it, it's not an underestimate to say that it was absolutely overwhelming. There are so many things you can, can look at and investigate. And obviously we have to sort of initially consider the, the strengths within house, but you know, as the, the, the project has developed, we now have a wealth of, of experience and expertise coming in to address all of these different sort of interactions that are, are illustrated here. So as I said, my focus is going to be on um, plant insect interactions, so specifically herbivorous species and also plant pollinator uh, interactions. But the beyond part is how these then have knock on effects in other parts of the system. And this is where all of these projects linking together is absolutely fantastic within the phase facility because we've got projects looking within the soil system. So with rhizotrons looking uh, rhizotron cameras, looking at root growth, people looking at soil biochemistry, moisture levels, um, soil respiration, uh, microorganisms within the soil, right the way up through all of the measures of plant physiology that you can imagine, measures of canopy, drone flights going over, looking at canopy greenness, looking at a whole range of different things, even above the canopy, looking at uh, air movements above the canopy. So while we all have our own little niche within this system, the true insight actually comes then from linking in with other people's data and starting to understand how that whole system um, works in response to elevated CO2. So it's a heavily instrumented site and we've got literally at this point billions of, of data measurements and obviously this is only going to go on for, for the remaining years of, of the project. But this is the, the fantastic thing about FACE is that you, you have your own understanding but it's amazing how you do become dependent and uh, link in with a whole range of other people that you normally wouldn't have necessarily had the opportunity to work with. So insects are absolutely fundamental to, to woodland systems. Um, hopefully most of you will know that they absolutely dominate biodiversity in terrestrial and freshwater habitats anyway, but in woodland systems, but they're by far and away the most biodiverse group. And that's right from the, the soil all the way up to the canopy. Herbivorous species are hugely important and they can have a direct impact on, on carbon budgets. 
And there are a number of examples now where actually big insect infestations can change forest systems from carbon sinks to net carbon sources. And this is because you have insect pests um, that if they're killing a large number of trees, obviously these trees are then no longer actively photosynthesizing, but the decay process is releasing carbon. Um, insects also play a really important role in shaping community structure and functioning. Um, and the pollinator interactions and the um, herbivory interactions are part of that. So they're sort of be the, the core focus of, of this talk. Most of the data, not quite all of it, but most of it is um, data that comes from uh, a PhD project in my lab, which was conducted by Liam Crowley. So he's up here on the, on the top right. Um, so Liam's actually submitted his thesis. Amazingly, he's got his Viva tomorrow. So if you're out there listening, Liam, best of luck for that. Um, but all of his, uh, his data is either just submitted or in prep for submission. So this is my one and only time I'm going to flag up the, the, the tweet symbol. But please um, don't tweet any of the data because this is stuff that we're still in the process of, of publishing. So the core question behind Liam's project was, are insects key drivers of change in woodland systems under elevated CO2? And so the first thing we really had to do was characterize biodiversity within the site. Um, abundance between different groups of insects and also monitoring changes in phenology um, across seasons and if there are any shifts um, that happen in that across the duration of the experiment. As I said, we focused in on herbivorous species and we're trying to understand how changes in um, nutrients and the chemistry of plants as a result of elevated CO2 might alter these um, plant herbivore interactions. But again, this goes beyond that because then we're interested in what are the impacts on the broader system if these things do change? So insects obviously are feeding on plants, but they're pooing out frass. The frass goes down into the soil. That's a very different source of, of nutrients and a much more labile source of nutrients, for example, than, than leaf litter. So these sort of changes and some of the examples I'll go through can have a big impact on other parts of the system. We also want to look at um, synchronicity of woodland plant pollinator interactions. So again, we wondered whether elevated CO2 might actually alter some of the dynamics of flowering plants within the, in the, within the wood um, and possibly change phenology patterns. Another reason this might happen is that we know elevated CO2 can change the timing of canopy bud burst. Um, it can also influence the duration and density of the canopy. So this could have implications for flowering plants at the, at the field level. So we wanted to have these as sort of our core areas of focus. The and beyond bit again is just to highlight, as I said at the, the beginning, that we shouldn't just be focusing on what's going on in the woodland because they are a really important part of the, of the broader landscape. So they're diversity hotspots for a whole range of ecosystem services provided in, in agriculture, so underpinning our food security, pollinators, which I'll touch on, but also biocontrol species that are, are regulating pest populations and part of an important part of integrated pest management. They provide essential forage and nesting habitats for a number of insect species. So again, we can't just um, think of them as a, as a, a resource for you know, the insects are using them during the, the active season. They may be using them as nesting habitats, but they're also important winter refugia um, for seasonal cold, but also daily cold um, within the shoulder season. So early um, spring and, and late autumn. So they're fundamental parts of the, of the landscape and there's a lot of research out there showing you know, a paper recently, Trees for Bees, showing that, you know, trees are an important forage source for, for a number of bee species, but actually they're massively underrepresented in the landscape relative to how important they are for a source of forage. So how did we measure um, biodiversity, abundance and phenology? So as with, with all experiments, this is a balance between trying to get a good characterization of what it is you're looking into, but not overwhelming yourself with crazy amounts of, of data. So this just is a summary of the different sort of trapping techniques we used. And the, the goal here really was to, to document what the diversity was in different structural parts of, of the woodland. So we've got pitfall trapping measuring invertebrates. Um, at ground level, we've got malaise traps and pan traps um, recording plants that are flying through the, the system um, and pan traps set up in different colours that, that sort of link in with the different kind of colours of flowering plants predominantly within the wood. Um, we've got beating, so active sort of knocking insects out from the understory and the canopy. And for each of these, there are different durations for how long we sample, there are different frequencies and there are slightly different numbers of, of sampling. 
but effectively it was trying to strike this balance that we're, we're trying to get a good representation of what is there, how are they changing um, across the year, um, and then how are they changing across years within the, the elevated CO2 and the, the controller rates. So this is a point I'll mention um, in other slides as well, but obviously, unlike the plants, um, for where you've had a, a lot of talks yesterday, insects are mobile organisms. So we cannot control for all of them, which ones are utilizing ECO2 and which ones are, uh, are utilizing the, the control arrays. For some of them we can, and they are ideal study systems and I'll, I'll focus in on some of those. But actually how they distribute themselves within the system can give an indication of what the, the sort of response is to elevated CO2 as well. So despite them being mobile, we can get a lot of insight in how they're utilizing different parts of that system and whether that changes under the different treatments we have. This is just a very um, quick and simple overview of a, a massive amount of effort on, on Liam's um, part, um, working through all of the insect samples collected um, across the, the range of traps. And this is just showing um, data for year one, but it gives you a, a pie chart with an overview of the, the orders that we've identified within our, our different traps. Um, and perhaps the entomologist wouldn't be surprised to find that the diptera um, are dominating and nearly 50% of all the samples collected are, are, are true flies, so diptera, but we've got a whole range of other orders and pretty much it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's an assemblage that is typical uh, of an oak woodland, um, which was reassuring. We didn't want to find out that having set all this up that we've got some weirdly unique bit of oak woodland that, that isn't typical. That's one thing to flag up here, and um, it doesn't come out in this pie chart, but something that is slightly strange at Biofor is that we haven't yet collected any ants in our, um, in our traps, which is slightly curious. And there may be some people working on ants out there that, that might be surprised to hear that. Um, and then we're looking at sort of changes in abundance and phenology. Uh, this is just a representation set from, from pitfall traps. We had similar trends with slightly different numbers, obviously, with the different trapping methods. But this is just to show that we're getting a, a gen, generally classical sort of phenological pattern of change uh, across the year. There are some interesting troughs and peaks that we then interrogate further and look at and see how they relate to um, the microclimate data that we're collecting. But there's this classic pattern of unsurprisingly increasing numbers towards summer, a dip, um, you know, reasonable numbers in autumn and then, you know, low numbers in winter, but actually a, a reasonable number of activities still in January and February for that particular year. And when we look at the microclimate data and see which ones correlate best, we find that actually temperature is the one that seems to be driving these patterns of abundance much more than things like precipitation. So precipitation is important, but temperature really is, is the best indicator at the moment for the, the data we have of, of what these patterns are, perhaps unsurprisingly given insects or exotherms. So that was just a very quick overview and sort of the conclusions coming out of this biodiversity are that Thankfully, we have a typical oak woodland um, dominated by um, biodiversity that you would, would expect uh, with a few unique characteristics. The site is being well characterized by the methods we're employing. So we think we've got the balance right of not oversampling the site and not having too many um, samples collected that we can't manage them. Um, as I said, it's dominated by diptera. These abundance patterns track temperature, not precipitation. Other information was that the canopy actually is the, the most stable thermal environment. So I had the, the, the lowest variability across that particular year. Um, and we, we obviously look at that as the years um, move forward. Um, and it was more diverse than the understory. Thus far, and this is beyond year one. So all, all of the, the years data we've looked at so far, so three years of data, um, we haven't seen any significantly obvious impact of ECO2 on general abundance or phenology patterns, but that's perhaps unsurprising because we're not really anticipating this to be a direct result of ECO2, it's more the indirect results on insects as a result of elevated CO2 impacts on, on plants. Okay, so the, the impacts on plants. So the first thing we were looking at was um, herbivory. And we know from a number of studies that elevated CO2 alters plant chemistry with one of the most common responses being an increase in carbon ratios. So that changes the, the nutritional value of the, the plant to an insect um, and therefore we're anticipating um, potentially different responses. But those responses could be different between different feeding guilds. So two of the, the sort of groups we focused in on were leaf miners. So we can see here, um, this is an example of a leaf mine. Um, and I'll explain a bit more detail, but these are a fantastic study system for a whole range of reasons, but they're feeding on the actual leaf material. So we might anticipate that they will have a, a quite a, a response to any change in leaf chemistry as a result of elevated CO2. 
Aphids, on the other hand, are feeding on plant phloem, so possibly it affects, but you wouldn't necessarily assume such a strong effect as, as for the leaf miners. And then just to mention another way in which we're recording more general herbivory, so not species specific for, with regards to the insects that are feeding, but um, species specific for different um, tree species, we've been collecting leaf litter right from the outset and using image analysis, we're documenting levels of herbivory. And so we've got a great timeline now of how those have and patterns of herbivory have changed and again linking it to climate and extreme events and all the other things that have happened across the, the years since the experiment started. So why are leaf miners such a, an ideal system? Well as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk one of the challenges with insects can be that they actually move um, within the system so they're not as, as, as compliant as plants and just sitting there and saying okay I'm ECO2 and um, I'm not ECO2. But with leaf miners, actually, we have got an organism that spends its entire um, developmental life history um, within a leaf. So adults lay eggs on a leaf, the egg hatches out, the caterpillar crawls into the leaf and feeds within the sort of meat of the sandwich of the, the leaf. Um, and it works its way through all of its developmental stages, all the larval instars, it pupates within the leaf, and you can even determine um, successful eclosion because there'll be a little emergence hole. So this is fantastic. We've now got an insect system um, that's an important herbivore within woodlands where we can document the impact of elevated CO2 on development. Um, and the way we can do that is because they leave this wonderful trace on the leaf, and this trace can be quite easily um, characterizable to a particular species. So you can identify the species often, often based on the kind of trace it leaves behind because there are only certain species that you find on, on certain tree species. And you can use image analysis, as I'll explain in a minute, to quantify this. So you've got a direct measure of how does elevated CO2 affect the, the level of herbivory in that particular species, which is fantastic. Leaf miners are found in, in a, a range of different orders, but the dominant one of the ones we were focusing on were within the, the Lepidoptera. Okay, so it's, it really is the perfect study system for this kind of experiment. So then we had these hypotheses about what might actually happen. So in the sites where we're supplementing with, with CO2, we're, we anticipated um, increased carbon nitrogen ratios and actually the data is showing that. So the data we have um, for, for leaf samples being collected now is that definitely a number of tree um, species are showing elevated um, carbon nitrogen ratios. That reduces the palat palatability of the leaf and therefore there may be some kind of compensatory feeding. Another factor could be that because they've got this increased resource with higher levels of carbon that the plants are able to increase their defensive compounds, um, which in turn results in reduced performance of the, of the, the insect and therefore decreased levels of, of herbivory. Uh, and then the final hypothesis really is the fact that they could be downregulating uh, their defense gene expression. Again, there's evidence of this under elevated CO2. And in this case, you may get increased performance of the um, the herbivore and increased levels of herbivory. So we were looking at oaks and, and hazel, most of the data I present are going to be on, on oak, but we were collecting 200 leaves from each array and for, for those samples for each year we were looking at the diversity of different species of leaf miner, the abundance of mines per leaf, um, and then we were able to quantify analysis by tracing an outline around the, the mine and then using ImageJ image J to work out exactly how much of the leaf had been consumed by that particular individual. And then you can start to get really nice data sets showing you what's going on with different leaf miner species or different tree species under the, the different treatments. This is just uh, the sort of the, the highlight of one part of that data set and to show the changes we noticed over the first two years of, of, from the point of, of fumigation starting. So here, this is um, data for, for oak leaves. You can see the, the different genus of, of leaf miners across the bottom, so stigmella, phylonerecta, exodemia. Um, and we can see that in 2017, there was no real change in levels of herbivory between control arrays and, and elevated CO2. But then for two of the species that we'd identified, um, there was a significant decrease in herbivory um, within the elevated CO2. For the hazel data, um, it was a similar pattern, but again, the, the results weren't quite significant. So as we've seen with this, this species here, there's a decrease in herbivory, it's not quite significant, and we were seeing similar patterns with, with hazel. But as we progress in collecting data as the years go on, we'll obviously know whether these um, patterns continue. But there's a significant impact um, on herbivory um, 
So one of the, the key things to recognize here is that we've only looked at a, a small number of all of the leaf miners um, within this system. So even given that, we've noted a higher density of, of leaf mines um, on oak leaves. So more than 40% of oak leaves within the phase facility um, had leaf mines, which is much higher than the sort of 10% uh, that's typical. Um, there was no real difference in leaf miner abundance. Um, in control arrays, when we calculated sort of the, the, the mean across or the leaf surface, on average, the leaf miners were consuming 2.73 meters squared of leaf surface area in 2018, but it was 1.95 um, in the elevated CO2 array. So that's a reduction of almost 30%. And the key thing here is to remember this is just a small fraction, as I said, of all the leaf miners, which in turn represent a small fraction of all the leaf herbivores. So the consequences across the whole system could be much more considerable. Another herbivore we've only really just started to look at, so Liam had enough going on his PhD, but he did manage to, to run this in 2019. And here we use sycamore aphids simply because they were a, a number of species that we could identify and they were easily accessible and easy to monitor on, on sycamore trees. And here the take home message so far is that abundance actually was higher um, within elevated CO2 arrays, not significantly, but we've only got one year of data. And then we're able to use, so an example here, these clip cages, so the image on the right, um, we can isolate individuals within a, within a single leaf and then we can monitor um, population growth. So we can monitor fecundity, um, how many progeny they produce and how the population continues to grow. And for that particular year, there was no impact or no difference between elevated CO2 and control on, um, on fecundity. Now where the whole system sort of comes together and where actually, you know, we may see changes across the, the 10 year timeline, but within that 10 year timeline, we sometimes get really interesting extreme events that can give us a lot of insight. So this is just to flag up what happened in 2018, where um, we had an extreme um, biotic event, which was driven really by extreme abiotic events. So beasts from the East, if you remember, um, resulted in a, a cold period and um, a sort of heavy snowfall uh, in March. And this meant that within the Bifor phase site, oak bud burst was delayed um, and the hatching of eggs, of overwintery eggs of any caterpillars was also delayed. But when all that snow cleared and when it warmed up, you had this prime system where bud burst was very synchronous and the hatching of caterpillars was very synchronous. And winter moth in particular dominated that particular event. So this figure shows what the greenness of the canopy was over 2017. And then when we look at the data for undisturbed and disturbed, this is what happened in 2018, where there was this continuing pattern as we would have expected from previous years. It then followed that pattern in the undisturbed sites, but there was a big drop in the greenness of the canopy where we've seen this defoliation. So we can now link that to see, okay, well, what happens in the broader system? Because here it literally was raining frass so insect poo is dropping down into the lower system. That's a massive pulse of nutrients into the soil. And we've already started to identify with our colleagues on other projects that there were changes in um, soil respiration at that point. There were changes in soil biochemistry. So this is where all of these different projects start to link together. So if I now move on to the final part, which is about plant pollinator interactions. So here, as I said, we're looking at a system where there might be a change in flowering phenology and what impact does that have on um, plant pollinator interactions. So we use bluebells because they're, uh, you know, conveniently already naturally growing within the face arrays and there's patches of bluebells in every array. And we were using photos um, to track uh, the changing in flowering phenology. And then we had um, periodic pollinator surveys to record what um, insect species were coming to, to visit the flowers. So this is the number of pollinators coming to visit. And then within bluebells, again, a great system, we have uh, the ability to, to determine exactly what the seed count is. Um, for the, for the different flowers. So this just shows you sort of a time lapse that emerges. And this really is, a bluebells are a fantastic system to look at the development of first flowering, the progression through flowering within the, each plant, and then the transition to senescence and, and seed production. So we really were able to get great images and document this change and compare elevated CO2 and control sites. So this data is, is um, just recently produced by, by Liam. Um, and this is showing that actually, we're already seeing a response in bluebells, it seems. So uh, they're flowering earlier in the elevated CO2 arrays, and on average, it's about six days earlier in the elevated CO2 treatments. But interestingly, the duration of flowering isn't changing. So it just means that flower production is pushed that much earlier into the season. 
Um, the midpoint as well of the flowering period between first flowering and uh, plant senescence is always is also six days forward. So there's this clear shift. and We're trying to understand exactly what might be driving that. If we then look at visits, we can see that visit numbers within that early flowering period um, aren't that high. They dominate within the mid and the later period. And the reason we broke it into these sort of early, mid and late is simply because we took the pollinator visits at two week intervals throughout the whole flowering duration. So therefore we had this early stage, mid stage and late stage. If we then uh, total all these up and break them down into which species and which orders are contributing those visits, we can see that there's a change in the pollinator assemblages as we work through the different parts of the season. Some species are pretty consistent, but there are changes as you work through. So we can then start to identify which ones might be most impacted by the shift to an earlier flowering time. Um, and therefore, which species might be negatively or positively affected. Obviously, it has implications both for the plant in terms of pollination, but also in terms of um, the insect with access to forage. And then finally, for the pollinator data, if we look at the seed counts, we can see this unexpectedly, um, sorry, totally expectedly follows the, the pattern of um, visit plant visits by pollinators. Um, but actually, the number of seeds produced, even though there were low levels of visits in that early stage, is quite high. So there were almost six times as many pollinator visits in the mid period, but seed production, so the return from those early flowers actually seemed um, much better. So just to conclude this, the bluebell systems are already showing um, this response to ECO2 with an earlier but not extended flowering period. This loss of synchrony may have a significant impact on plant pollinator interactions and then other parts of the system. So we're going to have ongoing monitoring of, of the bluebell system. We also want to look at other ones at, at different parts of the year. So ivy in particular we're interested in because this is a really important resource for insects getting ready to prepare for, for winter hibernation and entering diapores. Um, so this is another system we're going to look at. Okay, so that wraps up the, the talk and a, a run through of, of most of the work, as I said, undertaken by, by Liam. Um, there's too many people to, to mention everyone, but just to highlight that team here was one of the MRES students who helped collecting a lot of this data. We've also had a number of undergrad project students um, come and help, as well as master students, including people from Harper Adams. I particularly wanted to highlight the, the by four face um, core team, so Chris Hart's team, because without them, we just couldn't get this work done. John Sadler and Jerry co-supervised the project. And then special thank you to Deanne. So Rob's already mentioned what fantastic job she does with admin, but she literally and regularly gets her hands dirty collecting samples. Um, so thanks Deanne for all of your help with this as well. The Leverhulme Trust for ongoing PhD funding, and of course the Jabs Foundation for providing us with the site itself and all of their ongoing support. So thank you and welcome to take any questions. That's super. Thanks very much, Scott. Brilliant thought. Really interesting and um, great to see um, all that uh, work coming through like that. Um, Liam is online and um, and uh, has uh, been helping out with a couple of the questions um, that have popped up. Um, I've got one here, though, from Robin. Um, Robin, would you like to ask your question directly? Yeah, I'd be pleased to. Thanks, Rob. And uh, thanks, Scott, for that really interesting presentation. And thanks, Liam, for all that great work. Really interesting. Um, I'm interested in this area, and, and the question is, uh, is really um, you know, focused on the, the, the potential of this research from a practical forestry uh, perspective. And, and obviously, there's this huge crossover really between insect uh, uh, and uh, tree uh, and the convector tree pathogens. So the question is, 